Hatchet, Chapter 12 The fish spear didn't work. He stood in the shallows and waited again and again. The small fish came closer and closer, and he lunged time after time, but was always too slow. He tried throwing it, jabbing it, everything but flailing with it, and it didn't work. The fish were just too fast. He had been so sure, so absolutely certain, that it would work the night before. Sitting by the fire, he had taken the willow and carefully peeled the bark until he had a straight staff about six feet long and just under an inch thick at the base, the thickest end. Then, propping the hatchet in a crack in the rock wall, he had pulled the head of his spear against it, carving a thin piece off each time until the thick end tapered down to a needle point. Still not satisfied, he could not imagine hitting one of the fish with a single point. He carefully used the hatchet to split the point up the middle for eight or ten inches and jammed a piece of wood up into the split to make two to make a two pronged spear with points about two inches apart. It was crude, but it looked effective and seemed to have a good balance when he stood outside the shelter and hefted the spear. He had worked on the fish spear until it had become more than just a tool. He spent hours and hours on it, and now it didn't work. He moved into the shallows and stood, and the fish came to him. Just before they swarmed around his legs, some of them almost six inches long, but no matter how he tried, they were too fast. At first he tried throwing it, but he had no chance. As soon as he brought his arm back, well before he threw, the movement frightened them. Next he tried lunging at them, having the spear ready just above the water and thrusting with it. Finally, he actually put the spear in the water and waited until the fish were right in front of it. But still, somehow, he telegraphed his motion before his thrust, and they saw it and flashed away. He needed something to spring the spear forward. Some way to make it move faster than the fish. Some motive force. A string that snapped, or a bow. A bow and arrow. A thin, long arrow with the point in the water and the bow pulled back so that all he had to do was release the arrow. Yes, that was it. He had to invent the bow and arrow. He almost laughed as he moved out of the water and put his shoes on. The morning sun was getting hot, and he took his shirt off. Maybe that was how it really happened, way back when. Some primitive man tried to spearfish, and it didn't work, and he invented the bow and arrow. Maybe it was always that way. Discoveries happen because they need it to happen. He had not eaten anything yet this morning, so he took a moment to dig up the eggs and eat one. Then he reburied them banked the fire with a couple of thicker pieces of wood, settled the hatchet on his belt, and took the spear in his right hand and set off up the lake to find wood to make a bow. He went without a shirt, but something about the wood smoke smell on him kept the insects from bothering him as he walked to the berry patch. The raspberries were starting to become overripe just in two days, and he would have to pick as many as possible after he found the wood but he did take a little time now to pick a few and eat them. They were full and sweet, and when he picked one, two others would fall off the limbs into the grass, and as soon as his hands and his cheeks were covered with red berry juice, he was full. That surprised him, being full. He hadn't thought he would ever be full again, knew only the hunger, and here he was, full. One turtle egg and a few handfuls of berries, and he felt full. He looked down at his stomach and saw that it was still caved in, did not bulge out as it would have with two hamburgers and a freezy slush. It must have shrunk. And there was still hunger there, but not like it was not tearing at him. This was hunger that he knew would be there always, even when he had food, a hunger that made him look for things, see things, a hunger to make him hunt. He swung his eyes across the berries to make sure the bear wasn't there. At his back, 
Then he moved down to the lake. The spear went out before him automatically, moving the brush away from his face as he walked. And when he came to the water's edge, he swung left, not sure what he was looking for, not knowing what wood might be best for a bow. He had never made a bow, never shot a bow in his life, but it seemed that it would be along the lake, near the water. He saw some young birch, and they were springy, but they lacked snap somehow, as did the willows. Not enough whip back. Halfway up the lake, just as he started to step over a log, he was absolutely terrified by an explosion under his feet. Something like a feathered bomb blew up and away in a flurry of leaves and thunder. It frightened him so badly that he fell back and down, and then it was gone, leaving only an image in his mind. A bird. It had been about the size of a very small chicken, only with a fan tail and stubby wings that slammed against its body and made loud noise. Noise there and gone. He got up and brushed himself off. The bird had been speckled, brown and gray, and it must not be very smart because Brian's foot had been nearly on it before it flew. Half a second more and he would have stepped on it and caught it, he thought, and eaten it. He might be able to catch one or spear one. Maybe, he thought, maybe it tasted like chicken. Maybe he could catch one or spear one and it probably did taste just like chicken just like chicken when his mother baked it in the oven with garlic and salt and it turned golden brown and crackled. He shook his head to drive the picture out and moved down to the shore. There was a tree there with long branches that seemed straight, and when he pulled on one of them and let go, it had almost a vicious snap to it. He picked one of the limbs that seemed right and began chopping where the limb joined the tree. The wood was hard, and he didn't want to cause it to split, so he took his time, took small chips, and concentrated so hard that at first he didn't hear it. A persistent whine, like the insects, only more steady, with an edge of a roar to it, was in his ears, and he chopped and cut and was thinking of a bow, how he would make a bow, how it would be when he shaped it with the hatchet. And still the sound did not cut through until the limb was nearly half off the tree and the wine was inside his head and he knew it then. A plane! It was a motor, far off but seeming to get louder. They were coming for him! He threw down the limb and his spear and holding the hatchet he started to run for camp. He had to get a fire up on the bluff and signal to them, get a fire and smoke up. He put all of his life into his legs jumped logs and moved through the brush like a light ghost, swiveling and running, his lungs filling and blowing, and now the sound was louder, coming into his direction. If not right at him, at least closer. He could see it all in his mind now, the picture, the way it would be. He would get the fire going, and the plane would see the smoke, and circle, circle once again, then again, and waggle its wings, and it would be a float plane, and it would land on the water and come across the lake, and the pilot would be amazed that he was alive after all these days. All this he saw as he ran for camp and the fire. They would take him from here, and that night, this very night, he would sit with his father and eat and tell him all the things. He could see it now, oh yes, all as he ran in the sun, his legs liquid springs. He got to the camp, still hearing the whine of the engine, and one stick of wood still had good flame. He dove inside and grabbed the wood and ran around the edge of the ridge, scrambled up like a cat and blew, and nearly had the flame feeding, growing, when the sound moved away. It was abrupt, as if the plane had turned. He shielded the sun from his eyes and tried to see it, tried to make the plane become real in his eyes, but the trees were so high, so thick, and now the sound was still fainter. He kneeled again to the flames and blew and added grass and chips, and the flames fed and grew, and in moments he had a bonfire as high as his head, but the sound was gone now. Look back, he thought. Look back and see the smoke now, and turn, please turn. Look back, he whispered, feeling all the pictures fade, seeing his father's face fade like the sound. 
like lost dreams, like an end to hope. Oh, turn now and come back. Look back and see the smoke and turn for me. But it kept moving away until he could not hear it, even in his imagination, in his soul. Gone. He stood on the bluff over the lake, his face cooking in the roaring bonfire, watching the clouds of ash and smoke going into the sky, and thought, no, more than thought, he knew then that he would not get out of this place. Not now, not ever. That had been a search plane. He was sure of it. That must have been them. They had come as far off to the side of the flight plan as they thought they would have to come, and then turned back. They did not see his smoke, not hear the cry from his mind. They would not return. He would never leave now, never get out of here. He went down to his knees and felt the tears starting, cutting through the smoke and the ash on his face, silently falling onto the stone. Gone. He thought finally, it was all gone, all silly and gone, no bows, no spears, or fish, or berries. It was all silly anyway, all just a game. He could do a day, but not forever. He could not make it if they did not come for him some day. He could not play the game without hope, could not play the game without a dream. They had taken it all away from him now. They had turned away from him, and there was nothing for him now. The plane, gone. His family, gone. All of it, gone. They would not come. He was alone, and there was nothing for him.